just now I heard about two or three more sermons <laughs> in the text so we may come back to Hebrews 11 at a later date how strong is your faith have you ever considered walking away from the faith giving up on the faith I mean, there's so much going on in our country, and our world, that would make people, let me correct that, that has made people stop doing church. According to data from the Pew Research Center this past December, self-identified Christians make up 63% of the U.S. population in 2021, down from 75% just a decade ago. It's not just Christianity that is seeing a decline. The same Pew Research from December of 21 indicates that about 3 in 10 U.S. adults are now religiously unaffiliated, considered the religious nuns, if you, went, if you will, N-O-N-E-S, a number that has doubled over the past 15 years. From Jesus' day until today, people have left the faith. Many remain, and there is something to be said for focusing on those who remain, and that's exactly my charge today, to encourage those of us who remain in the faith. But this phenomenon of people walking away from Jesus is not new. One of my favorite discourses in the biblical text is in the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. After Jesus feeds the 5,000 plus women and children, Jesus begins teaching his followers, saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. The followers started grumbling, annoyed, and I'd say confused by Jesus' words and claims, and they began to disperse. Verse 66 of John 6 says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus said to his 12 chosen disciples, do you want to leave too? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Isn't that just Precious, those words have stayed in my heart since the first days I heard them. Where would I go, Jesus? You, you are the only one who gives me the words of life that feeds my soul. I so identify with Peter in many ways, but especially in this text. Given the turmoil of life challenges, Specifically for me as a black woman in this life, called to several male-dominated fields, and in my life I feel like, Peter, Jesus, where would I go? You are the one who have set me and my ancestors free. What's your conviction? How strong is your faith? 
Because people like those in the scriptures have walked away from the faith for every reason from Jesus' teachings to misunderstandings about Jesus' teachings to turmoil and ineffectiveness and even hurt in the church. But I want to submit to you that our faith should be so personal like Peter's that we say boldly, I'm not going anywhere. If it's not there for you, my prayer is that this message encourages and strengthens your faith. But let me not downplay the difficulties of holding on to one's faith, especially for the early Christians. Many who were Jews who believed in Jesus faced severe persecution, brutal physical harm, which is not far-fetched in a society that used crucifixions as capital punishment. Scholars believe that the writer of Hebrews, or shall I say the preacher of Hebrews, they believe this was more of a sermon than a letter, is writing or preaching to Jewish Christians who were struggling to stay with the faith for many due to the severe persecution for being a follower of Jesus. These are the folks who make up the original hearers of Hebrews, for the writer says to them in chapter 10, verse 35, but recall those earlier days when, after you had been enlightened, you endured hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to insults and afflictions, and sometimes becoming partners with those so treated. He later says, do not, therefore, abandon that boldness of yours. It brings great reward. He says, in a very little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. He says, my soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back, but we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but among those who have faith and so preserve our souls. Not only are the people enduring hardship, they've been told that Jesus is returning and literally they are waiting day by day for Jesus to return. You could imagine getting discouraged when another sun up and sun down, there's no Jesus. The preacher of Hebrews is doing some heavy lifting today. He's admitting that times are hard, yet encourages the tired, worn out, discouraged followers not to shrink back, not to give up, not to throw in the towel. He encourages them by saying, the righteous live by faith. And that language means something to them, the righteous. The righteous live by faith. They keep on going by faith. They keep striving by faith. They keep believing by faith. In the midst of hard times, the righteous, the preacher says, they keep doing God stuff, Jesus stuff. They keep doing it by faith. Well, whatever faith is, it must be a powerful force powerful matter, if you will, to be able to motivate, inspire, and reinvigorate those who are tired, worn out, or threatened while they wait for Jesus' return. Whatever faith is, it must be some strong, powerful stuff. What is this faith stuff? Glad you asked. It was probably written all over their faces, too, the desperation that comes in the midst of persecution, struggle, crisis, pain, illness, and even death. He had to see it all over them to bring such a message of faith. Someone may have even sent them a, a message, almost like a text message. What is faith? He answers, and in my opinion, he answers well in today's scripture, verse 1 of Hebrews 11, he says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This is one of those verses that the English translators have struggled with. If you go to different translations, you're going to find different words. But I appreciate that they try to, to make it plain for us. The Common English Bible translation, which I often go to, says, faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we do not see. Here's what I believe the, he the writer of Hebrews is saying, faith, while it is hoping for something that is not yet, 
has implications in the now. While it is in something we cannot see or someone we cannot see, our very way of being is proof of what we don't see or who we don't see. You've probably heard the wind analogy when you talk about faith. We can't see the wind, but it, when it moves us, Anybody ever walk through the eastern parts of Hyde Park and that wind actually moves you? When it moves you, that's the proof that the wind is there. Well, when the Holy Spirit moves you to act, to be, that is proof of the Holy Spirit. We just like that, our movement, our way of being is a display of faith. It's the substance of faith. And we become the proof, the tangible evidence of that which we believe. What do you hope for from God, the one you cannot see? The assurance of those things you hope for should cause you to act and to be. And that way of being it's faith. It's the substance. It's faith. Don't worry if it's confusing. It clearly was confusing to the original hearers because this teacher and preacher gives multiple illustrations. You don't have some of these verses in your bulletin, so check your Bible when you get home. But Hebrews 11.4 starts by faith. Abel offered a better sacrifice to God than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he didn't see death. He was given approval for having pleased God before he was taken up. By faith, Noah responded with godly fear when he was warned about events he hadn't seen yet. He built an ark to deliver his household with faith. He criticized the world. I like that. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And if you're anything like me, you're starting to say, OK, preacher, where are the women examples? <laughs> the Common English Bible credits Sarah's faith in verse 11. By faith, even Sarah received the ability to have a child. Though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. The preacher of Hebrews uses the ancestors, say the ancestors. The ancestors. And the history of his audience to illustrate faith. Because when we reflect on how the ancestors survived and made progress despite hardship, let's call that history, and the evidence of this is our very presence. That's the perfect formula for encouraging us to keep on going in the faith. Now let me pause for a public service announcement. This is the very reason that as children of God and followers of Christ, we should be on the front lines of the fight to stop the movement to ban history to change history and to control, monitor, and dictate the history taught to our children. Because if history had been banned, we would not have the sacred text. We would not have the Old Testament. We wouldn't even have the New Testament. We would not have the Bible if, if history had been banned. Christianity relies on the history of a people. If history is banned, people won't know how what came to be came to be. If history is banned, so many people won't know how their ancestors made it over. As the, Hebrews of uh, of the preacher of Hebrews runs down the history of the ancestors to encourage the faith of his audience, please allow me to run down the history of my ancestors. I pray it encourages us all for it is indeed American history. 
For by faith an enslaved preacher, Nat Turner, led a rebellion of enslaved people in August of 1831. And while it led to much bloodshed and death, it also set the idea of emancipation in the hearts of many until it came to be. By faith, Harriet Tubman and so many others led the Underground Railroad freeing enslaved people and further advancing the emancipation movement. By faith, don't miss that part, say it with me, by faith. By faith, by faith Reverend Richard Allen started the first national black church in the United States, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, in 1816 because he and others knew that if they should be free anywhere, it should be in God's house. Amen. By faith, black people migrated, much like Abraham North, not sure of where they were going or what they were going to find, but they went anyway in hope of freedom from oppression and pain and Jim Crow. By faith, Rosa Parks, Dr. King, Coretta Scott King, Reverend R Ralph Abernathy, and Reverend Jesse Jackson, and so many others crafted and executed a civil rights movement with a strategic, strategic decision to adopt an approach of non-violent resistance and protest gaining voting rights and housing rights and employment rights and beyond. They did that by faith. By faith, African Americans broke barriers and became pioneers in every walk of life. By faith, Jackie Robinson, a devout Methodist, broke America's baseball color line. By faith, he faced racist hatred with courage and conviction dignity and grace, and I say to you, he did that by faith. By faith, Thurgood Marshall, a lifelong Episcopalian, became the first black Supreme Court justice with a career dedicated to civil rights advocacy and litigation by faith before coming a Supreme Court justice as chief counsel of the NAACP, he argued and won the landmark Brown versus Board of Education case before the Supreme Court and as an Episcopalian, he did that by faith. By faith, Ida B. Wells, following the lynching of a good friend, became an internationally known leader of the anti-lynching movement. By faith, right here in Chicago, Ida B. Wells organized Illinois' first black women's club whose first project was to raise money to prosecute a police officer for killing an innocent black man on the west side of Chicago. By faith, Wells spoke out against racism and discrimination wherever she found it. Now what about your ancestral story? What did they do by faith? And if you're going to be someone's ancestor, what will they look back and say, my grandma, my grandfather, my ancestor did that. And they did it by faith. The faithful actions of your ancestors and my ancestors, and just like the biblical ancestors, are the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of a God who is able. So when things get hard, if you ever feel like walking away from the faith, reach back and get the ancestors. Whoever's ancestors were faithful, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, it's all about God. But the ancestors sacrificed. They took risks. They challenged the status quo. They worked for a more just and equitable future. And they survived against the odds and terrible conditions. And we have to remember that they did all of that by faith. If it had not been for the Lord who was on their side, and Hyde Park Union knows that's not a cliche because we preach it in Psalm 124 which says, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, and then the psalmist says, let Israel say, in other words, everybody join in, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, 
He goes on to say, when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. Praise be to the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In other words, yes, our ancestors did many, many great things by faith. So thank you, Father Abraham and Mother Sarah, for believing God by faith. And thank you, Noah and Mrs. Noah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Miriam, who were obedient to God by faith. And thank you, disciples, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all those unnamed women and men in the faith who advanced the cause of Jesus by faith. And thank you, Rosa Parks and Dr. King and Coretta Scott King and Thurgood Martin. Marshall, Jackie Robinson, and Ida B. Wells, and all the others leading the civil rights movement, enduring all you endured by faith. But if it had not been for the Lord, who was on your side, on their side, they would not have been victorious. For the victory was all God's. But because the people did by Faith, they moved by faith, they acted by faith. What God is planning, God's plan is beginning to unfold. So be encouraged. In the midst of your struggles, just put your struggles in perspective against your God. And if you can't imagine God, look back at what the ancestors accomplished by faith. And then you'll see God. Because ultimately God gave all these victories. And if God did it before, God can do it again. The word of God for the people of God.